good afternoon and thank you for coming today. I'm Allie Wilkinson and as Gina said, I'm a science writer and I also run a website aimed at sort of shaking up that stereotypical perception that we think of when we think of a scientist. My interest in science really started at a young age. My best friend in kindergarten, her dad was our school science teacher. And so just about every week after school, I'd have a play date with them and we'd either be at her house, which was a complete zoo with every animal you can imagine, or we'd actually be in the lab at the school. And her dad would rehabilitate injured wildlife he found and we'd release it. And so this is really where my interest in science began. Um, I actually tried to have a, a cow eyeball dissection as a birthday party, but one, one of the other little girls uh, wasn't really into that idea, so her mom called to say, Megan wanted to come to my birthday, but was a little bit scared, and so we made kaleidoscopes instead. <laughs> so science was always sort of the, the path. I went to a marine biology camp in the Florida Keys, and then I went to college with the, uh, the notion that I was gonna be a marine biologist. So during my time at the Florida Aquarium, I got to really learn a lot about how the aquarium worked, some of the different programs that they have and the different departments you can work in. Um, this was Flip, one of our sea turtles, who had been uh, hit by a boat. And so our rescue team brought her in, and once she was in good health, but not well enough to be out in the wild, we transported her to the shark tank. And, um, up on the top right-hand corner, the gentleman with the brown hair actually then came to be a biologist here for a while. I also did an internship in the fisheries monitoring program at Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, I found I was not very well suited for that because after you catch the fish and you measure it, you have to throw it back and make sure it doesn't land in the net again. And it's really hard to throw a slippery fish that's about this big, much further than about three feet. So I ended up doing research my final year of school. Um, this is my friend Christy that I did the research project with. And what we were looking at was the effect of fiddler crab burrowing on white mangrove seedlings. Um, these other plants in the picture are called sawgrass. It's a, a type of plant called a sedge, which have sharp edges. So I have actually bled for science because those suckers will just cut you as you're walking through or, or trying to work with them. And so what we did was we set up cages, and some of them had a very fine mesh, so that way there would be no fiddler crabs, and then other ones just had a, a larger mesh around them. And what we found out was that the presence of fiddler crabs actually improved the tree's ability to grow. They're almost like little ecological engineers, and those trees that had the fiddler crabs nearby, they, they grew taller, they had more leaves. Um, and this sort of introduced me to research, which I loved, but I couldn't figure out what I wanted to research for the long haul. Uh, the original plan was I was going to be a full-fledged scientist for life, and I just found that there was too many areas of science that I loved. So I was watching Blood Diamond one day, and I decided I was gonna go to journalism school as a way to give myself a new skill and buy myself a little bit of time to figure it out. I've since been told that the inability to commit is actually the mark of a, a good science writer. And it's a great field because you don't have to commit to studying one thing. You can almost be the eternal student. You pick an area, you do some research, and then at the end you write a paper in a way. So if you like school, it's a, it's a great career choice. So over the course of the past few years, I've gotten to intern at several places. Um, nonprofits, government agencies, and my work has really comprised all different fields. I've done writing, I've done work for radio, uh, video podcasts, and even designing bookmarks for scientists to hand out at talks like these. Uh, one of the coolest things I got to do though was, I got to go up in a C-130 with the Coast Guard about two years ago. It was right after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and they were allowing journalists to go on a flight with them while they went looking for oil. So in this photo right here, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but these little marks that look like scratches on the photo, it's actually a type of oil called transparent sheen, which is the most difficult one for the, uh, 
the Coast Guard scientist to spot. But it was really a, a once in a lifetime experience to go up Fourth of July weekend with the Coast Guard and, and really see firsthand what had happened out in the Gulf of Mexico. Which brings us to the stereotype. Um, for those here who aren't part of the Teen Ocean Summit, what some of the teens have done earlier today is draw scientists, and uh, it's actually a very popular activity that teachers use as well. And people have found that as young as kindergarten, this stereotype exists that when asked to draw a scientist, there's the glasses, the beaker or the test tube, and the white lab coat. And for anyone who's actually encountered a scientist in real life, um, most of them don't look like this. In fact, most of them uh, look like the person sitting next to you in this room. So it doesn't help <laughs> that TV and film have really helped to enforce this stereotype. Um, we were actually talking about it over lunch, and, and we think that the media has come a little bit because when I was growing up, you had Bunsen and Beaker from The Muppets, and you had Doc Brown from Back to the Future, and Steve Urkel. And they were characterized by the zany hair, and the glasses, and the lab coats. Nowadays, you have Dr. Temperance Brennan and Dr. Sheldon Cooper from TV shows, and they look more like your next door neighbor, except they're still portrayed as being very awkward and, and socially inept, and yes, there are scientists who wear glasses, there are scientists who wear lab coats, and there are scientists who are a little bit awkward. But there's also scientists that skateboard and rock climb and you know, are, are very social. And so there's not really one mold for being a scientist. So this sort of gives you um, a good example of how important it is for kids to see what scientists look like, because if they don't have that ability to picture themselves as a scientist, they might not think of it as a career option because, quite frankly, if you thought scientists all looked like scary <laughs> guys like that or, you know, like mad scientists who blow things up, it might not be the most appealing career. This is what a scientist looks like is sort of a, a better way to show kids that scientists really are just normal people and, and make it appealing. Um, so, uh, we actually have in the audience Dr. Katie Pratt, who was the first scientist to be featured on the website. Um, Katie is a molecular biologist by training, and she was a huge help in running the site. So the website really came about from a conference that Katie and I were both at. Our keynote speaker was a former NFL cheerleader, and now she's a primatologist and a National Geographic explorer. It's a pretty cool career change. <laughs> and so I think her career path was amazing, and her talk really focused on her journey. She hadn't gone to college, and then after being a cheerleader for a while, she decided she wanted to go to school. And then at the end of her college career, she just had to take a science class to fulfill a requirement, but she found out she really wanted to pursue this, and so she asked her teachers about going to school to be a primatologist. And at the same time, I was reading her book, and I read how her entire life, she's gotten this negative feedback. You're too pretty, you're too girly, you can't be a scientist. And people have never taken her seriously. And she thought, OK, well, after I'm more accomplished, then they'll start to take me seriously. OK, maybe with my next achievement, then they'll really take me seriously. And she's had national parks set up in Madagascar. She has done phenomenal things in her field, and yet, other scientists at this conference were giving her a hard time and, and saying, but she doesn't look like a scientist. And so I thought, well, that's sort of a weird thing to say, especially coming from another scientist, because they should know that there is no way a scientist looks. So I started this photo project where Katie launched it by being the first person to send me a photo and a little blurb about her. And it, it's kind of just snowballed from there. And people have made the site what they want it to be. If they wanted to tell a little bit more about their hobbies or explain their research in depth, they have. If they want to show a picture of them in the lab or at their field site, or a picture of them with their kids or rock climbing, they have. And it's been great to see 
how multifaceted scientists really are. So uh, this is the website. It's called This Is What a Scientist Looks Like. And we have an immunologist. We have a physicist and astronomer from Columbia. And scientists have sent in photos from all over the world. Um, we've had scientists from Brazil and Ghana and Norway. And it really shows that this is something that scientists worldwide get behind. This is a, a physicist who's also a model. So it really goes to show that <coughs> scientists travel all over the world in their line of work. And they do all sorts of things in their free time. Um, Although, at times, science can really take a lot of, of time and effort and dedication, it also doesn't sap your entire life away. Uh, this is some of the feedback that I've gotten from the site. We've had parents and students and, and teachers write in to say that they love getting to see all the different scientists, whether it's you know, they grew up around scientists and it really helps portray that this is what they've known all along, or that it's opened their eyes to new career opportunities. And looking through the website myself, I wish I'd known about some of these different careers when I was younger. Cosmetic chemist, I think, would be a really cool thing. Um, a geologist is something I wasn't exposed to until college, some of the different areas of work that they do. And it was only when my friends started job hunting, I thought, oh, that's that's really awesome. If I could go back and know a little bit more, maybe I would have chosen a different area of science. And um, it's been really great for people to get the opportunity to have their perceptions changed. Uh, one of the comments I got recently was from a student who wanted to say how excited they were that their teacher sent them to Tumblr for homework. <laughs> and so what the teacher had them do was choose one scientist from the website that they thought was interesting and have them explain what the scientists did and what they looked like. And then the second step of the assignment was to see if the scientists from the site looked similar to the scientists that they drew in class. And then finally, if their ideas changed about who can be a scientist and why. And so that's been really the, the best part for me is hearing that teachers and, and science educators have been using this site to show kids because Yes, there are those people who get to go to Fermilab for a field trip, but there's other schools who just, they don't have the resources nearby to, to go on a tour or the facilities might not be open to giving tours to the public and students. And so it opens doors for people who might not have that opportunity. So the question is the craziest line of work and, um, and sort of personality. In terms of research, I don't know if it's, it's been somebody off the Tumblr, but um, actually, I think they did send in a photo. Uh, a deep sea researcher that I met um, spent their entire life wanting to study deep sea fungus. And now they study deep sea snails instead. Um, in terms of craziest sort of personality, we, uh, we had one submission that was a makeup artist who um, did theater, and so they, they really had a sort of crazy makeup set up where half of them was made to look like men and half of them was made to look like women, all with, with makeup. That one was pretty cool. Um, but really, it, it's just been skydivers and you know sports fanatics and rugby players. And so it, it really encompasses a wide range of personality types, rock stars. Uh, Occasionally, people send famous people in that they want me to post. Um, one of the people from Queen actually was an astrophysicist, which I thought was pretty cool. And the author of the book Lolita was a lepidopterist, which meant they, they studied butterflies. So people sometimes end up in completely different areas from science, but interesting. Oh, OK. Sorry. Uh, the question is, if I find myself doing a scientific analysis of people or things, um, I think just from growing up being so interested in science, I do look at things with a more observational eye. But uh, now I mostly focus on sharing science, whether it's actually translating it from a research paper into something that you could pick up or read in a newspaper, or doing more outreach and educational activities. OK, so the question is what I do in the line of my work. Um, the opportunity to get to go up with the Coast Guard was really a, a great experience, not a typical work day by any means. 
occasionally you do get to go on these cool opportunities or you get to attend a conference. Um, otherwise, a lot of the time what I'm doing is I'm looking at some of the, the latest research that's been published and writing about that or when I've been in-house at an institution, what we do is we try to share the science that they're doing there. Whether it's um, their journals that they publish and finding the, the most important research being done to share with working journalists so that they can share it with the world. Or planning events like press conferences or uh, public speaking events. My favorite topic that I got to write about. Hmm. Probably gonna have to say Anything dealing with the ocean, uh, since marine biology was always my initial passion, it's always going to be my first love. Um, when I was interning at the American Geophysical Union and actually got to the point they told me I wasn't allowed to write about any other ocean science stories because we had other topics like space weather, which I know absolutely nothing about. So uh, probably stories that I've done, especially pertaining to coral reefs. My favorite animal that I worked with? Hands down, it was the giant Pacific octopus at the aquarium. She was nicknamed the brat because her tank was very cold. It was about 50 degrees. And a lot of times, zoos and aquariums provide enrichment to keep the critters from getting bored. So with our octopus, we would put her food in a hamster ball or like a Tupperware you'd maybe make iced tea in. But the rule was you couldn't just put it in the tank for her. You had to wait until she grabbed it out of your hand. And so on days that the tank was really, really cold, she would take her time and she would go down to the bottom and across and slowly make her way up. And at that point, your arm was numb. And on days that the tank was a little bit warmer, she would be reaching her arm over the top of the tank, trying to grab the food while you were still trying to put it into the hamster ball. So she was by far the most interesting. <laughs> All right. Thank so you.